It's rare to find a figure who is at once a public celebrity known around the world, but is also a intellectual powerhouse in, uh, in artistic and philosophical terms. But that, that's exactly what we find in Albert Camus. Born in 1913, he lived until 1960, a short life, but a very productive one. He was born to European parents in French-ruled Algeria. This is a crucial fact of his life for shaping his later work. He was educated through scholarships with periods of work at odd jobs or as a tutor. He had to work his way through school. He had to build himself from nothing. That's also very crucial to understanding who he is. In 1940, he moved to Paris to work as a journalist. Paris in 1940 was a kind of a dicey place, but certainly an interesting one. He tried to enlist in the French army, but was rejected because of a lifelong bout with tuberculosis. And he went on to become very active in the resistance movement against the German occupation. Now, throughout this time, he was a key player in the social circles with figures like Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. And after the war, Camus became a very active lecturer and advocate for political causes, including as a staunch critic of Soviet totalitarianism, which he saw as a betrayal of socialist economic ideals. He died in a car crash in France when he was just 47 years old, robbing him of the opportunity to uh, develop and refine his ideas a little bit more, let's say. But it also froze in amber his, uh, his character and his work which has to this day a remarkable consistency of reception ever since. His major works are significant uh, and, and, and they are fairly manageable to get through. Probably the most famous work that he is one of his earliest, 1942, comes out with The Stranger. Then that same year, writes an essay called The Myth of Sisyphus, very famous philosophical thing. So he wrote one novel, one essay. He also wrote plays that were extraordinarily influential. He goes on from there to write The Plague, 1947, The Fall, 1956, another collection of essays that's very important in 1957 called The Rebel, and a collection of shorter works short fiction in 1957 as well. Again, that, that linking, he had remarkable bursts of productivity in individual years, and he also left some, uh, some unfinished work after his, uh, after his death that some, uh, some critics have been uh, uh, digging into. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature at 44 years old. The, he is, the, to date, the second youngest recipient in history. That's 1957. Again, 1957, a very big year, and tragically just three years before he died. You can see many consistencies throughout this very concise body of work, however. More than anything, his work centers on notions of free will, the choices people make within brief flashes of control within a universe seemingly beyond all control. Camus in this, Camus is a prime example of existentialism, the philosophical method, if you will, that questions the meaning of human existence or even the existence of any such meaning. He is also associated with a term called absurdism, which is the philosophical and literary movement that denies any possibility of meaning and that seeking it only causes conflict and suffering. In a, in a 1955 preface to The Myth of Sisyphus, Camus describes the essence of his work as an artist. He says they all illustrate that essential fluctuation from assent to refusal, which, in my view, defines the artist and his individual calling. Assent to refusal, the fluctuation, choice, free will, this opportunity for you to exercise a kind of human dignity, a kind of humanity in defiance of a universe that seemingly doesn't care. Significant. And in the essay on Sisyphus itself, uh, uh, Camus centers on this possibility he sees for free will to offer some kind of meaning. Now, Sisyphus is a figure from Greek mythology who 
pissed off the gods, as humans tended to do, and he was condemned in hell to push a large boulder up a rock, uh, struggling, straining. It would take hours and hours, pr pretty much in, uh, all day, only to get it to the top of that hill and then see it roll back down. So he had to go down and push it back up. And what Camus sees in that myth, what he sees in that moment, is really pretty extraordinary. He writes, I see that man going back down with a heavy yet measured step toward the torment that will never end. That hour like a breathing space which returns as surely as a suffering that is the hour of consciousness. At each of these moments when he leaves the heights and gradually sinks towards, their lair, towards the lair of the gods, he is superior to his fate. He is stronger than his rock. You could say that that is an image of futility. You could say that that is an image of absurdity. You could say that he is just acting out what he has to do anyway. This is pure compulsion. But for Camus, he is seizing on that moment and saying that, no, that is an active choice. That is the figure saying, I will go down and do that, even if I am compelled to do that, that I have choice of my own. And it is in doing that and in taking that agency that he sees uh, a parallel for the human condition within a world that is beyond all logic to him. And remember, in the post-World War, or even in the run-up to the war, events were beyond human understanding. Events were beyond human imagination. The horrors that were being unleashed on a regular basis were overwhelming. And he was responding to that as a as an intellectual and as an artist. And getting that one-two punch is really very significant. So his work is fairly coherent from start to finish, and you can see in it a very clear through line. In Camus, you have to look for, number one, colonialism. He grew up in the colonial era feeling like an outsider, feeling like a second-class citizen. He was a European living in Algeria when the Europeans were running things, but he didn't necessarily reap any of the benefits of that because to the French, he was just an Algerian. To the Algerian, he was just another European. And, well, he was poor, so that made him worthless from all points of view. And this also can be extrapolated into a, a, any instance of the exercise of power. Camus likes small groups who, ha who have power over one another, individuals who are struggling with questions of control over themselves and over other people and over the world or attempts over the world. And this is, of course, leading into the question of human agency, what we can actually do, free will. Can we actually exercise anything that we want? Can we do anything at all that we might want? Or are we just going on at the compulsion of others? Or are we subject to this indifferent universe who does not seem to care about our, our free will at all? We were all just cogs in the machine. Now, on a stylistic level, Camus fits more in the period known as neorealism, which is really more of a cinematic uh, category in this age but he is very much a practicer of it, very much a materialist, real things. He is not going off on wild flights of fancy linguistically like a Joyce or a Proust or a, uh, or a wolf, but he is exploring simple descriptions of real material things that you can see and expressing it very clearly and very simple and in very simple language but the power of it comes in a implied symbolism within all of those material things there is always meaning behind it he's not trying to do it with just the flourishes of language he's trying to build his meaning brick by brick through meaning in symbols meaning in things and that is where all the real fun and debate comes in. And it's also where you get a bit more freedom of yourself as a reader 
to move away from, okay, the core of his ideas he expresses in the philosophy, but the way he expresses it in his art gives us some agency to say, oh, well, this kind of means this, or this could mean that. And that's where it really starts to take off. So in a way, his art has much longer legs than, uh, than his philosophical writings, which is generally the case throughout history. Now, Albert Camus personified a kind of cosmopolitan cool in the post-war era, but his work pulses with a kind of seething rage within. And this dynamic of living intensity, straining against uh, the barriers of an indifferent universe, that is the core conflict running through everything he wrote. 